Welcome to Lecture 5 of Advanced Microeconomics with me, Dr. Craig Webb. In today's lecture, we will be studying the value of information. Remember, in microeconomics, when we talk about information, we mean information is a reduction in uncertainty. Now, information will have value in this sense because it will help a decision maker make better decisions. Before a decision maker receives information, they use their prior beliefs, their prior probabilities to assess which action is the best action when taking uh, decisions under uncertainty. When they receive information, they're going to update their beliefs using Bayes' rule, and it might be that the uh, best action changes after they receive information. This is the sense in which information will have value if it helps a decision maker change their mind about the decision that they're making. If they don't change their mind, the value of that information will be zero. And if they do change their mind because it will lead to an increase in utility, then that increase in utility is the value of information. So we'll start by developing the theory for the value of information uh, for single person decision making and prove that this value must always be non-negative. After we've done this, we'll look at, look at uh, two examples where information may well have negative value. Of course, this is moving outside of the world of single person decision making. Our first example, we'll look at a competitive insurance market, the Rothschild Stiglitz model we saw last time. And our second example, we will look at uh, games of incomplete information. Lots to do. Let's get started. Okay, so before we develop the theory of uh, the value of information, let's go over the basic model of choice under uncertainty again. We saw this in lecture one, um, but we're going to need it today. So for choice under uncertainty, if we remember, we start with a set of states of the world, which will denote capital S, and we'll use lowercase uh, s's for the states, states S1 up to Sn. And remember that um, if you know the state of the world, there is no uncertainty. And uncertainty exists when you don't know the state of the world. Okay? So this describes the uh, uncertainty. And for decision making, we're also going to assume a set of outcomes. We won't say much about this, but... They're essentially the things that the decision maker is interested in. So we'll denote these capital X. You could think of these as amounts of money, but in general, they could be anything. Um, now, what are the objects of choice for choice under uncertainty? Well, we're going to call them uh, actions today. Okay. Um, so similar to what we called contracts before, sometimes these are called acts rather than actions. Actions is often used in game theory, uh, but we'll use act, so we'll use that today. Um, and we're going to have a set of actions, capital A. And what do we mean by actions? The decision maker has to choose an action in a sense. So if we denote by lowercase a, which belongs to the set of actions, a typical action, well, it's going to be a um, essentially a state-dependent uh, outcome. Okay, so you get an out a different outcome possibly in each state of the world. Now, you could think of this as a essentially taking states and turning them into outcomes. So actions being functions from the set of states to the set of outcomes. Um, for example, you might have an, an action A, which in state one gives you £10, and the action A in state two gives you £20, and so on. Okay, so you choose the action A, and then in different states you get different outcomes, or you could choose a different action um, A, B, C, and so on. 
uh, which give you different outcomes in different states. Okay. So these are the things where the, these are the objects for which our decision maker will have preferences. He wants to choose between two different, choose between uh, the actions in this set A and choose the most preferred one. Okay. Now, when we work with preferences for choice under uncertainty, we're going to use the expected utility model. So separating what he believes about the likelihood of the states and his tastes for the outcomes. So essentially, we're going to have a probability measure and a von Neumann Morgenstern utility function. Okay, so the decision maker has a probability measure. which we can call his prior, um, which is P over the set of states S and all subsets of these, the events as well. So we can talk about the probabilities of states, the probabilities of events. We know what a probability measure is. It assigns a number to every state that is non-negative. It's an additive function, so the probability of state 1 or state 2 would equal the probability of state 1 plus state 2. And also it's normalized so that the probability of um, this entire set, capital S, would equal 1. Okay, so we've seen that before. Um, so what would expected utility look like now in this model for an action? So expected utility, which is what our decision maker wants to maximize, um, let's put of an action A would be, well, with some probability PS1, state one occurs, and the outcome you get would be A of S1. And you take the utility of that. So the utility of the outcome A S1. Okay, so if I take the action A, in state one, it gives me this outcome A of S1. I take its utility and multiply it by its likelihood. And then I sum over all states to take the expectation the expected uh, utility value of this action. Okay, so that's how we would calculate the expected utility of an action A once we know the, prob the decision maker's probability measure and the decision maker's von Neumann Morgenstern utility function. Okay, now the decision maker's only goal in life is to solve the following problem, maximize, and so let's do a shorthand for this. Let's write the expected utility of the action like this. Okay, so I'm going to write the expected utility using probability measure P and von Neumann Morgenstern function U of the action A is this term, and then the decision maker just simply wants to maximize the expected utility using their probability measure by choosing the action A subject to A belongs to our set of actions. Okay, so this is a very general model. All of the uh, cases that we've seen so far um, for instance, choosing between two different contracts in the insurance model can be phrased in terms of this very general abstract approach. So this is what a decision maker is doing when facing choice under uncertainty, choosing the action from the set of available actions to maximize expected utility. So now that we've recapped the basic model of choice under uncertainty. Um, let's talk about how we would uh, value information. Okay, so let's start by just um, noting that the decision makers problem before they receive information is to maximize the expected utility of an action using probability measure P von Neumann Morgenstern utility U subject to 
uh, that this action belongs to the available set of actions which uh, is given to us. Okay, now uh, what do we mean by information? How are we going to model this? Well, we're going to talk about something called an information source. Okay, and what do we mean by that? Well, essentially, it's a, it's a, a set of possible messages. So let's draw a set with a message M I, and I is equal to one. And let's say there are uh, k different messages. So this information source is going to send a message to me, something like this event has happened, um, and there are k different messages that it might send. Okay, so. Um, in order to put a value on this information source, uh, we're first going to talk about the value of a message. Let's say message um, M1. Okay, so what's the value of message M1? Well, what does a decision maker do when they receive message M1? Okay, they're being told some new information. It's not going to change their utility function U. Their risk attitudes don't change, but it might change their beliefs. Okay, so we have an update. We update our beliefs. We're going to update our prior beliefs to form a posterior uh, probability measure. So let's label this as P prime which, uh, so P prime, the new probability measure of uh, this state S, will be equal to the original, the prior probability of S, but updated, so conditioning on the fact that I've received message M1, okay? Now, we would know how to calculate this using Bayes' rule. We could say this is equal to the probability of state S, um, multiplied by this term, so the probability of receiving message 1 conditional on state S, all divided by the probability of receiving message 1, okay? So if I, I already know the probability of state S, that's my prior belief, I need to know two things. This thing on the bottom, the probability of receiving message 1, is sometimes called the unconditional message probability. And this chap on the top, the probability of receiving message 1 conditional on state S is, uh, is called the precision of the message, okay? So we'll assume that our decision maker, when they receive the message, they, they know enough to form this updated posterior, and all they would need to know is how likely am I to receive this message, and what is the precision of this message, okay? So our decision maker knows that. Okay, so... Let's go back to their initial problem. So initially they were maximizing expected utility by choosing an action A star. So let's call this problem one, okay? And now let's say let A star solve problem one, okay? So A star is, what the, is the action our decision maker was going to choose before they received a message of any kind. Okay, this was kind of their best effort all by themselves. Well, now they've received the message, the decision maker um, needs to re-evaluate his options. So now he needs to solve the following problem, maximize the expected utility, but now using probability measure P prime, so the updated beliefs, the same utility as before, and choosing an action subject to... This action belongs to our set of actions, okay? So let's call this problem two, okay? Problem two, my beliefs have changed. My risk attitudes are still the same. I reevaluate the actions using expected utility updated with updated beliefs. And let's say a double star solves two, okay? So potentially I've got a new optimal action. Okay, so what's the value of this message? Here is the definition. The value of the message 
Vm1 would be the expected utility I get using my new, using my latest information when I choose the new optimal action minus the expected utility I get using my new beliefs. I'm not going to throw the information away of my original action. Okay, so here it is. Essentially, once my beliefs change and I was choosing A star, this is now my revised uh, evaluation of what my expected utility will be. If it turns out that changing my mind to a different A double star uh, is better, then the difference, it, the increase in my expected utility I get is the value of that message. Okay. Now, the most common mistake I see uh, when evaluating this is to forget to use the updated beliefs in both of these expected utility evaluations. Okay. So intuitively, you might think, well, why don't I use my initial probability um, measure here and the new one here? OK, now we can discuss this a lot on the forum and I can explain why it would be inappropriate to use my old beliefs at any point when I've received new information. So just remember, this is an ex post. So after I've received the information is when I place the value on it. And I only place a value if, if sorry, it only has value because it's made me change my mind. OK, now notice that a double star here is optimal. It solves the problem of maximizing expected utility. OK, so if a double star is equal to a, this is obviously zero. Otherwise, a double star must have higher expected utility. So we can conclude that the value of a message must be non-negative. OK, um, you would only change your mind because it gives you increased utility and the increased utility you get from changing your mind about the action you're going to take is precisely why the message has value, the difference in expected utilities measuring that value. Now that we've seen how to calculate the, the value of a message uh, from an information source, it's quite simple to calculate the overall value of this information source by taking the expected value of the messages that this information source might send. So the procedure goes as follows. For each possible message M1 through to MK, calculate the message values VM1 up to VMK in the way that we've described uh, previously. Once we know these message values, we can weight each of these um, values by the relevant probabilities. So there is a probability PM1 that the information source sends message M1 and so on up to message MK with probability PMK. And then take the value of the information source to be the expected value of the messages. So take value of message one and weight it by the probability of message one and do this for all messages and sum them up, taking a weighted sum. Clearly, because each of the message values are non-negative, the value of information overall cannot be negative because this is a weighted sum of non-negative values. Now that we've seen the theory for how to place a value on an information source, I'd like you to work through the example in the lecture notes. And also there is another example, practicing placing a value on an information source in this week's exercise class.